you have uh, a different problem. <laughs> and now I got a different problem. Yeah, I mean it's <laughs> it is true actually. We uh, we first met in Ankara in uh, uh, like about twelve years ago. Wow. So, uh, and uh, Elaine was prepared to give a talk on percolation. So <laughs> from physics to math to well geometric rankings. Um, anyway, so I didn't understand anything from that talk. I will I'll admit, but it was it sounded very cool. Uh, then we came here and started working, uh, Peter, with Peter at Langlands, and then uh, I remember actually I met a lot of these uh, people in the room about 10 years ago again at the uh, Elders at 40 conference, and uh, well now we're at the Elders at 50, so it's a pleasure to be here, happy birthday. I actually have a birthday present for you, well <laughs> technically my mom gave it, so it's <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it after the talk. So, um, I mean, I will. I won't talk about ge geometric theory. I'll talk about uh, the number theories. <coughs> Actually, uh, well, the most primitive one. I'll stick to Q, and uh, I will talk a bit about GL two. I'll first start with like uh, the general general. Uh, Perspective. I'll try to like put things into context as Q did, but uh, what I want to do is I want to uh, motivate certain questions. I mean, this is all about Dion van der Stoffe, so I'll start with Dion van der Stoffe as it was uh, as it was uh, first stated in I think 2004 or maybe 2000. So this was. Uh, in Langland's paper, which had uh, well, this comment, uh, which may be like, well, I guess we can say, what if it works? So this is the Turkish for that. I mean, it has a story, but like, uh, so it still is at the stage of what if it works? Maybe a bit more, but like, uh, once you start, uh, once this thing. Once you start working on these things, it kind of like ramifies and gives uh, some interesting problems. I want to actually uh, talk about them at the very end. Well, I mean, the, the second half. And one of these problems, funny enough, was mentioned in the uh, in the original paper as a <coughs> as a coincidence, and it, it wasn't going to be uh, important. <laughs> but like, I think it's pretty. I mean, I think it's interesting. So. Uh, let me start with first Beyond Endoscopy. I mean, what was this? Uh, Chu introduced. So, Beyond Endoscopy. Was the attempt, well, is the attempt to actually uh, prove functional reality conjectures uh, by looking at a group. So, um, I mean, what are the conjectures? As we said, we have HL, GL, nice math. And then uh, we should have some sort of a transfer of packets here. I mean, it should satisfy a lot of properties, but like in particular, what is important for us is it should satisfy the L function. So for any representation LS pi H of, uh, say, sigma, <laughs> it should be equal to LS. So, and the idea was, I mean, there are various perspectives on the matter. I'm going to take the uh, analytic perspective. The idea was uh, to somehow isolate, and this is maybe in quotes because not, I mean, there, there are various perspectives you're going to isolate. Isolate those representations in G, well, that are or not. You hope that if you can isolate these things that have transfers, maybe you can compare it with like different groups so that you can actually prove that they have transfers. And um, for this, the uh, radical, or like the, uh, uh, well, how to isolate them was to use the. Uh, what, what do you mean those representations in G? 
functions are the complete, like, the big L functions. Okay. I mean, I will quite often actually take uh, the unramified part of the L function, so maybe I should mention that. Um, so, I mean, for all of this, of course, I'm going to fix a finite set of places. And, uh, well, including infinity. And uh, I will, I mean, whenever I write L, quite often I'll mean LS. LS. Um, because I'm going to be looking at the poles of these things, and it should be in principle at least that these, like the partial L functions, should be using these poles. Um, so I use the L functions, LS phi, rho, to detect. And how does the uh, the mechanics of this work? Uh, we're going to move, so I'll move around, move rho around, and whenever this thing has a pole on real S greater than or equal to one, then this thing should somehow be related to a uh, an automorphic, a, a transfer. So it should be a transfer. Um, so. I mean, all this introduction, basically the uh, problem, or like the original problem, boiled down to can one understand the poles of LS phi rho for various rows and pi. Um, I mean, of course, one would like to do that, but uh, it's hard. Like, how, how would one try to understand this? One idea was. Okay, so uh, in order to understand poles, we can consider the logarithmic derivative of this thing. That was the original idea. And the residue of, well, okay, now I'm going to actually fix some things. I need to make a distinction between which poles I'm talking about. So, but in general, these things can have poles arbitrarily to the right of uh, real s equals one. But, Basically, the ones which have poles <coughs> off of the line real s equals one, they're going to be non-transferred, and somehow, well, they'll be important. I'm going to come back to them, but for this introduction, I'm going to assume that these things are of dominating type. So the only poles that we expect are actually on <coughs> real s equals one. So I'm going to stick to pi of pi satisfying Ramirez integers. Okay, again, that was elementary, and uh, the poles are. So one can look at the residue of this ls pi rho at s equals 1 to get the order of the pole, or one can consider, as Chu was saying, ls rho at s equals 1 to get the uh, residue of the pole. So they both give if the thing has a pole or not, but the issue is uh, one has more information, so to speak. The uh, residue also has the residue. And in order to calculate the pole, Langman suggested looking at the partial averages of these functions. So if you write down ls pi rho as, uh, say, a n of pi rho, referring to the s, <laughs> then looking at the partial averages, the limits of partial averages, so in the second case, it is just the partial averages of these functions, of these coefficients, a n pi rho. And in the first case, you're just summing over the, uh, uh, the prime powers. Well, this should, in principle, give you the residue. This, I'm not going to say much about the uh, residue of s equals 1 at l s pi rho. I mean, this is assuming the pole is simple. If the pole is not simple, it gives the basically principal part of the whole thing. 
So uh, and Langlois was saying, all right, so we're going to look at these coefficients. These coefficients are traces of the Hecke operator. So we're going to basically uh, sort of put in the uh, trace formula and look at just averages over these pi's and pi rows. Ends. So this this was the game for me for a long time. This was, uh, I mean, it still is. If I could do this for. Uh, Um, but in order to understand this, so now this is the trace of some operator, so let's call it uh, n, rho. So n depends on the nth coefficient, rho is the um, representation of the L group. Then you use the trace formula on the geometric side um, to write this thing as, so the sum over n is still up here. Of certain orbital integrals, <coughs> sums of orbital integrals. So F n rho of n. Let's call it time, time series volume of n. Uh, this is the general problem. If I can actually get the asymptotic behavior of this sum as something like a name term times x, say a constant, which won't depend. And the ramification data times x plus, say, a power saving. So sorry. Uh, this would actually imply the analytic continuation of the function. Well, maybe not as what you would like. I mean, this doesn't give a functional equation or anything. It just tells you that the function has a certain behavior, like certain things uh, sort of falls, and then the rest is uh, sort of the metamorphic continuation past. Which is a start, I'd say. It's uh, it gives a lot of analytic data, but you know, once you have this, you can start um, applying these results. All right. So this is the uh, this was the motivation of what is coming up now. Uh, so how does this look like? Like, what are the problems? What are what one can do about this? Well, in order to describe the problems, I think the easiest way is to uh, actually, I'm going to spe specialize now to a very specific case, GL2. I guess that is more or less the theme of today. Everybody is going to say something about GL2. So for GL2, what does this look like? Um, well, it looks like the following. So first of all, I need to tell you what this trace formula or orbital integrals or whatever it is. Well, I need to fix a finite set of places S. Let me just do the uh, what Langlois said in his paper and set S to be infinity, just the Archimedean place long. So this just means we're going to be considering these automorphic representations, which are not ramified at finite places time. Um, and one thing to keep in mind, maybe I should uh, mention the things that I'm going to say are more about the analytic problems that are uh, about this limit or like the sum. There are certain algebraic problems too. Bill will, for example, talk about the following problem. I mean, and, I mean, two was saying like for a given n and rho, there's a nice way of actually writing this function. But uh, if you actually try to write these things down. In the trace formula, even for GL2 and symmetric powers, it actually becomes a bit of an issue. I mean, it's kind of like you need to decompose sin k of sin L, which I don't really have a very nice formula. I'll, I'll show you exactly what you do. So you will tell me an asymptotic formula. <laughs> you will tell you exactly what you do. Seriously? Yeah. Okay. Oh. A week ago, it was asymptotic. <laughs> it's not clear. It, it, it becomes simple only at asymptotic places. The formula is very. Actually, very convincing in a way. Okay. There's some kind of, I think there's some kind of vital character formula for symmetric powers. I don't know what that means, but. I, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So apparently, uh, this is good for GL2. Um, anyways, I mean, I, your pictures are very pretty. So that's <laughs> all I know. Uh, anyways, I mean, there are. Th there are a lot of problems that come with this. I mean, some of it, some are very like actually like 
I'd say old school invariant theory type problems. Some are more like uh, asymptotic analysis problems. Some are more maybe algebraic geometry problems. Uh, I will talk about two. One is, well, one is an interesting thing. I have no idea uh, if it is, like what it is about. It is about the difference between these two and how it is reflected in this average in the very simple case. And the other one is about this coincidence that I was talking about. Hopefully, uh, I'll have enough time to convince you that the coincidence is maybe not a coincidence. Um, so for GL2, what does this look like? The trace formula for GL2 for this very particular case is going to look like the following. It is going to be a sum over, well, traces. Uh, this is going to be a, a, a number, basically. A whole number, because we are uh, restricting ramification. There's going to be a function, an infinity component, because we are allowing things to move around in the infinity component. Remember, I've fixed an integer n here. This is the n peg operator. So I'm writing this part for each n. So it depends on n. It will depend on rho. I will specify what rho is in a second. Uh, n over, like, say, q root n times an L function, L, uh, uh, L1, actually, of n squared minus 4n. Here, I'm taking, I'm restricting myself to uh, Rho equals standard from GL2 C to GL2 C. This is just the, uh, for certain things, what is this, standard representation? Um, for certain things, it doesn't really matter what I restrict rho to. For certain other things, it will matter. So uh, let me just stick with the standard representation. And whenever I can generalize, I'll actually use cal. So what is this? I mean, this is a nice formula. This is basically saying you're averaging a sort of function times an L value. So the L value is the uh, Hurwitz class number of the order. So L1 m squared minus 4n is this. It, it is essentially the following, m squared minus 4n over L, say, 1 over L. So it's almost this with certain weights coming in. But I'm not going to write it. So it's kind of like the uh, empirical L function. The uh, difference is this m squared minus 4n. You have to emphasize that this is a GL2 L function. Which? Oh, no, no, this is empirical L function. This is GL1. Yes. So this is class number. This is GL1. This is Dirichlet. Yep. GL1, Dirichlet, quadratic character. Quadratic character. So this guy is the quadratic character. So it's basically asking if this thing is a square or not, basically. Um, and what did I want to say? What do I say? Theta infinity. So theta infinity is the, uh, related to an orbital integral and a discriminant factor. So it is the, um, you can think of this as, so n is going to be, so this is going to be the orbital integral of an element in GL2. So an orbital integral depends on the conjugacy class, which is the trace, which is m, and the determinant n. Uh, by the choices that I'm making, this only depends on the ratio between m and square root of n. So think about this as like PGL2 represented GL2. No idea. It's invariant on this thing. So this is the orbital integral times the discriminant factor. So the discriminant of GL2 is m squared minus 4n, square root of this. Uh, but it doesn't matter what it is, per se. What matters is this function is, well, nice smooth, uh, well, nice and not nice. So it's compactly supported in the sense that, like, you know, these m's run roughly up to n, a uh, square root of n, but it's singular. So it has, so this is not smooth, in, at least in our case of, uh, in our cases of it. It's a uh, single rate real, real variable, yes. yes. Yeah. So, let me, let me see. Mm -hmm. so it looks like the following. Yeah. Okay. Graph yeah. on R. Well, it has a smooth part, so let me forget about the smooth part. But like the non-smooth part is like looks like a semicircle. So it has 
I'm sorry. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to ask you, what is a smooth part? Because that's, that's what that affects. So there's some asymptotic scale, I think, that's <coughs> So your, your smooth curve approaches. Right, right. I mean, there are certain asymptotics, but like the asymptotics are dominated by the singularity. Because I'm going to take the Fourier transform of this, the smooth part, I can use like uh, integration by parts of these decays. So are you going to give us an exact formula for this? The uh, asymptotics? No, the, the function. Oh no! <laughs> I mean, it's the uh, it's it's okay. an orbital integral times a discriminant. If you want, I can write it. No, 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 that's all right. Somewhere in one of your papers, I can find it. Uh, paper one, page five, I think. There you go. Okay. <laughs> but but like. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, he actually writes it. It's that's what I stole beyond, from. Beyond, beyond. Yeah. Okay. It's um, I think I mean, uh, Shelstead's paper also has this. Like, I'm I'm sure one of your papers has this. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I mean the only thing that is important for us with, with that function is that it is it has a singularity. The thing, uh, the, the nice thing is that the singularity is not arbitrary. It is uh, literally the singularity of x squared minus one. one. So if you write theta of x as this, it is this times a smooth function essentially. So was this I mean, essentially? There's a plus. If you multiply singularly times smooth, you don't get smooth. You don't get tons of these things. Right? That's what I said. It's not necessarily smooth. Uh, I see. So you're, you're <laughs> so you're <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's not smooth. I'm gonna smooth it out in a second. That's oh, a different okay. thing. But then it's not going to be analytic. That's. Uh, I mean, that's. Can, can I just say? I guess it, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is this is a normalized uh, orbital integral. This is a normalizer. Yeah, so. Yes. Exactly. At the, at the present day, the discriminant is, is zero. Which yes. Is which is the uh, plus the minus one over yeah. yeah. So it depends entirely on what happens at the real time. I mean, this one, yes. But if I change this set right here, and this is the only reason I'm getting this at the infinity place. I mean, of course, Archimedean and uh, Vianic works slightly differently. But the only reason there's only that function is because I fit S to be just infinity. Okay. If you enlarge s, then you're going to get some viatic singularities too. Okay. But at the end of the day, it will always be, I mean, the singularity of this will be only finitely confined, I think. Okay. The rest is the rest of this. Um, anyway, so this is, so basically we're having, we're summing, this is uh, <coughs> what the trace formula gives for GL2. We're summing over a function which is not necessarily smooth times some arithmetic quantity, which is like jumping up and down depending on whatever this quantity is, like it's the class number of the quadratic field basically generated by this. So this is not a nice family of quadratic fields. It's not a terrible family either. But one thing I may say is at this point, <coughs> so this is for row standard, I said, from GL2 to GL2. I mean, GL2 doesn't have very many representations. This is a dual case, so. Um, while you can take symmetric uh, ant power, say, yeah. <coughs> so this is GL2 to GL n plus 1, um, well, this is going to have certain problems. Like, what happens here is you're essentially doing the following. You're changing, well, you're doing two things. One is you're putting a k over 2 here. Oh, sorry, n over 2 here. So your determinant is like n, I mean, roughly. And you're changing the family that you're averaging over. You're putting an end here. For, uh, and, and so what kind of curve do you get? Two way. What, what kind of curve do you get there? What kind of curve do I get? Yeah. No, the curve here is always the same. Because this is the function, right? Theta of x. The uh, issue is you're summing. So you were summing like for each given n. At the beginning, you were summing like square root of n terms. Now you're summing like a lot more of them. And now the, uh, the L value, the jump, like, I mean, the, the family has changed completely. Like, you're summing over the family of cur like uh, quadratic expansions defined by this one, x squared minus y to the n, rather than x squared minus y. You see, x squared minus y is a linear family in y. Okay, so you can move. But when you take, like, y to the n, it becomes a very weird thing. It's a so the structure of the I'm, 
It certainly is. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is the difference. So what I'm going to say is basically, um, so there are a few things that uh, can and should be done. See, what they're trying to do is know what the trace window looks like. So what we're trying, this is for one hand. So in the, in the following sense, n is the integer operator, the n integer operator. That formula that I wrote over here actually expresses this. So now I need to sum this thing over n. So um, at the end, we have a double sum, and we're trying to look at the SM products of this. Some function, it doesn't matter what this is, but it's all some L. Um, I mean, it looks simple enough, but like it gets fairly complicated very easily. Um, one of the uh, so the yeah the, the problem is get the asymptotics of this as as x goes to infinity. Yes, asymptotics of this expansion. I know, yeah. So this is zero. And for higher n? I mean, it took quite a while to actually prove that this is zero. Uh, for higher n, for n equals 2, you're going to get an x. I'm, I'm going so to come, come down to that. <laughs> this is actually a, and, and, and right, like x to the 3 halves so times something. So, and, and, and for 3? Uh, for three, it should be zero in generic cases, but like depending on your central character and it's like whatever it is. Huh? <laughs> I mean, this is, so what I'm doing is this. <laughs> Just look at GL2 and decompose like sim4 of whatever it maps into GL2. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So uh, I think you have a, uh, I mean, there are finitely many cases here that dihedral are going to contribute here, and then I think only dihedral in this case. Well, there will be a quaternion in here. So what, what's the leading term? I'm, I'm not sure what the, what's the big difference actually for that. Oh, and here it's going to be x log x for the fourth. Yeah. Depending on what you put in there. Because the issue is, so you see, this is actually looking at the residue of the L function. If the L function is a higher order form, you're going to get like logs and stuff yeah, in yeah, there. Yeah. And uh, uh, but it doesn't matter. Like for what I'm going to say, it's just you can ignore like all this. Okay. So um, what I'm going to say is this: uh, in order to analyze this, there are various ways of uh, doing it. The uh, one problem, as Peter pointed out, is uh, I was actually cheating a bit when I was writing the trace formula. Here's the following, and now uh, I'm going to start talking about the. Uh, the problems that the whole beyond endoscopy may actually be uh, leading towards. One is the following, so assume problem here, let me say. Some of these problems are, I think, more within reach than some others. So one problem is, well, first of all, I was lying a bit in the trace formula. This is just the elliptic part of the trace formula. In the following sense, in GL2, the conjugacy class can have an eigenvalue that forms in the field, non or uniform, these are the uh, uh, elliptic ones. There are extra things that are coming from uniform and uh, uh, hyperbolic conjugacy classes. This is one thing that uh, this will be the, I'll come back to this in a second. But there's one more problem, which is maybe more intrinsic to this, that is the following. So the L2 decomposes as the continuous part, right, plus the uh, discrete part. And the trace formula somehow is giving a, uh, an expression for the trace of the operator over the discrete part. And even here I'm lying a bit, which I will come back to. Uh, but at the end, what I want to say is like, in our case for GL2, the discrete part has the hospital spectrum, which we are interested in, plus the uh, trivial representation, which is not hospital. And if you look at the L function of the trivial representation, mm -hmm. it actually has a pole at 
x is the three halves. So maybe I should put x to one minus alpha. So there's a known constant here. Um, so the trivial representation actually is the dominant contribution to this asymptotic always, <coughs> not just for this uh, particular case. And it has to be uh, taken out. And for a general group, this gets even more complicated because the discrete part has the possible and the non-tampered part, like non-Ramanujan part. And the non-Ramanujan part needs to be isolated from the trace formula. <coughs> In the geometric side. And well, I mean, there are ways of doing but you need to find a sensible way in the following sense. So I'll just put for a general group, general group, there the uh, non tampered discrete contributions to this, to the spectral side, which you need to isolate on the geometric side. So they need to be isolated. I mean, in a sensible way, in a useful way. So what do I mean by a useful way? I mean, you can try to do the following. You can say the trace formula gives the identity trace of pi of f, say, is equal to sum of, say, certain volume times orthointegrals. OK, I'm just going to subtract trace of pi of f from both of sides, like both of the sides, and I just that's not what I want. What I want is some sort of virtual expression once you uh, get these things out. Um, and the way, so one approach for this was actually done about like four years ago, or maybe five years ago, by uh, in, a Frank, in a paper of Frank uh, Langlands and Nero. <coughs> and what they do is they write down the elliptic part, this thing, which I wrote for uh, GL2. They write it down for uh, any group. Maybe I should say any, but like many groups. Uh, for any G, they write the uh, elliptic part as a sum over what's called the uh, Hitchin Steinberg Steinberg basis. Steinberg Hitchin basis which is nothing but, so the uh, geometric side is a sum over conjugacy classes, or well, stable conjugacy classes in this case, actually, uh, of the group. And a stable conjugacy class is determined by its invariant, the characteristic polynomial. <laughs> so you just uh, write this thing over basically a, a sum over the characteristic polynomials. And this space that is parameterizing the characteristic polynomial is an affine space, so uh, this affine space that uh, allows you to use Poisson summation somehow, which gathers up uh, all the information nicely. And uh, so if you write this thing in a, just transform this as a sum over the Hitchin basis and apply a uh, Poisson summation formula here, well, then you get, here? which one? No, this is just for uh, the number theory. I mean, well, it works for the function theory. But if you do this, what happens is the following. So you actually get the contribution of the trivial representation pretty clean. So you get it as the uh, integral of, so as the zero term, essentially, of uh, the Poisson sum. But then the issue is, once you do a Poisson sum here, you get a Fourier transform over the Hitchin basis of these orbital integrals. So these orbital integrals themselves are singular, like functions with singularities. So this part becomes pretty unmatched. So you can just get the trivial representation nicely, but the rest is, uh, is a bit of a mess. So and this kind of like, um, 10 more minutes, that's good. This is a problem about kind of analyzing these quantities, these L1 these uh, class numbers that are appearing here. Because I mean, you can write down the L1 chi d as an Euler product over the, uh, over all places. And you try to do a uh, local 
Fourier transform at each place. I mean, you can do that. That's that's all good. What you're going to get is like this thing, although like was a compactly supported function at each place when we started, and it's locally constant. No, locally constant. Well, <laughs> not locally constant. You take the Fourier transform, it becomes like infinitely supported. So it's supported everywhere. Um, and that is like at the heart of some of the difficultness here. But instead, <coughs> what one can try doing is try to do is to understand these, like maybe just uh, control these better by using some other tools. One tool, which is kind of a trick, is uh, one can use an approximate functional equation, which uses the additive structure in the functional equation that these things satisfy. Um, this was something that I've done, well, now, about five years ago. Uh, but one can use, so this was, I'm going to call this this plainly identified the trivial representation. Uh, one can use an approximate functional equation <coughs> to uh, handle these volumes of chloride that are coming actually here uh, <coughs> to identify, <coughs> to actually go further down. Just You don't just identify the trivial representation. Identify the trivial representation. You can actually show that this result holds. So you can actually push the uh, L function and get some analytic continuation, at least for uh, special rows, rows standard and well, row two and x squared, third, but not sure, uh, and get some analytic continuation. So these are things I kind of like. Uh, this is like the analytic structure of the. Uh, Problem. The problem is like literally you have some arithmetic quantity that is varying over a family and you have a function with singularity that it's weighted by and you're trying to like understand this structure. One thing that I want to tell about this approach is the following. I want to actually now talk about since I have like what, five minutes or ten minutes. I'm not going to describe how this thing goes, but like what it leads to, like some certain problems or interesting phenomena that I think Jim is going to talk about some more and more about these things. But I want to say two things <coughs> about the non-obvious nature, maybe, of these sums. So this is the second part, basically. So two, two problems that I want to say, or two uh, phenomena. One is the first one that I want to talk about is um, it actually is about the lie that I was telling you about this being the trace formula. So this is only the elliptic part of the trace formula. So if you write down the rest of the terms, so this, there's an extra sum coming from uniformly high Paul quantity type that we're going to get into. So there is a sum. Understand the uh, behavior of the L function, I'm supposed to be averaging this thing over n. n is the n plus x over 1. There are too many variables. I know they're too important to remember. So at the end, for the symmetric first power, the standard representation, what's the expression for pi? That. L s pi is the integral. Unless pi is the set pi factor. So what does that mean? That in particular, in this case, Spangen tells you that 
the average that you're getting off this domestic side should be in the minimal tax treatment. I mean, more, it's more than the minimal tax, <laughs> except like profit sharing. But I'm pretty much in there too. It's a fair scale. I'm not sure. <laughs> and what is the uh, the sum? Well, the sum actually is this average over n. Lambda is like the sum of three terms. So what you expect is if this thing is going to be small, then all of these three terms should probably be small. What comes out to be the case is that this is not true. That actually, so these in particular, these two things actually in particular have limits. So the sum of the sum of L n actually is. This is for Costco. So what I did, so I used actually a very uh, elementary, well, not elementary, but Delbert's great formula for weight per customer. Not, not, not like fancy. I didn't even include mass form. And even there, these two things have individual limits. Right? The limits actually are not there. And it gets even better or worse, depending on your uh, <laughs> personal choice. <laughs> so this is the case for LS summing over all coefficients, so you're looking at the measure. If you're looking at L prime over L, so you're just summing over uh, the prime, so like you're looking at the overall control, then these three are all zero, which is uh, not exactly true. What so this is kind of like a reaffirmation of the fact that uh, since you're taking the square root of the number, there are so many numbers within the, like so many whole entities that are within the Prime powers. So I, I don't know. So what this thing is actually is so for pi standard, so L prime over L, both of these permutations are zero. Does this say anything about I'm actually weighing everything by log. Yeah. Uh, but this is, I mean, this is a particular phenomenon. I don't know how they know this is, or I don't know if this is uh, pointing to like using business natural or static natural. But all I'm saying is, if you use the trace formula, it's actually something very like this is very harsh. And even in this very simple case where you expect the number to be zero, not every like each individual piece. And this is coming from weighted originals here, where this is the limit of L. And this is like, actually, these are R originals too. They're very classical type originals. And the last thing, the uh, second problem. So this, I mean, this is, as I said at the beginning, the sums of classes are more tractable. Some of these are not tractable. This is, I'm not exactly sure how tractable this is. Maybe for GLN. Seems to me from an analytic perspective that by changing the representation, you actually make the like mass form like this may be actually better. I think I think this is better. Uh, and the second problem that I'll talk about is the uh, and I promise I'm not going to take too long. <coughs> it's about this coincidence that. Uh, And this is uh, this I believe is more tractable because it does not require the extra average over average. Here's the uh, the thing. So for a general group Q, 
is you have this continuous quasi-discrete and as I said, discrete part has all these contributions from non-transfer terms and whatever, but like, let's forget about that for a second. So this trace formula is supposed to give you this trace of R discrete, all right, which is the orthogonal progression of the discrete part. Well, as far as the, the trace formula is concerned at the moment, it seems you can, there's a discrete part of the trace formula, which includes the discrete, but which is not limited to this. In the sense that there is a discrete part of the trace formula, uh, it is it is basically a sum over invariant distribution, as you can see, is discrete into the trace formula itself, which includes this as a subsum, but it's not exactly this. There are more things that are coming from continuous trace than invariant distribution. And um, so this is, uh, I mean, one of the things that actually plays for people that are the right to write this sort of thing. It's a sum over Levy-Schwartz matrix of the distributions, and each Levy-Schwartz matrix contributes to a certain piece. And uh, well, now I'm going to assume that everybody will remember Jekyll Lane as this is. Number six on Jekyll Lanterns. So this is the uh, trace of M0 pi M. I think I, I forgot to do that. So this is basically an intertwining operator evaluated as zero, the trace of this guy. And uh, well, trace of in any case, it doesn't matter what it is, but uh, what's important to us is. If you actually take that term and the discrete part of the trace formula, plug it into here and take the uh, limit over n, it gives you a non-zero contribution. So it survives this thing. So it, it gives you a workspace in a sense, but it gets better in a specific sense. Uh, that like these things, these uh, interconnection contributions, and what is if you're going to actually try to understand or use the trace formula, and this is like independent of the underlying stuff now, if you're going to actually take the trace formula and use it to understand the hospital part of the spectrum, you need to isolate these three guys. There's no other way, right? I mean, at least I think. <coughs> uh, if you're going to, for example, I was going to talk about families, but you uh, beat me to it yesterday. <laughs> so, I mean, one thing I had in mind was like, You're going to do not a soft like Haley thing as you thought it, but like if you're going to go into actual n term multipliers, then one is the isolate of the three. And this, what's coincidental? Well, this already appeared in Beyond Endless Sophie. It actually comes up in this analysis that I mentioned before. One can do this by isolating it somehow, and it is also appear magically in the elliptic part of the trace formula. Uh, as like, and you can see them after uh, a Poisson sum, but you can't, one, one can do these, you can isolate them. At least in GLC, as a matter of fact. Uh, in the elliptic part. And they actually show their face after a pretty rough case of Poisson sum, but again in the GLC. So the zero term is like very easy. It's kind of like you know encapsulates all of the information about the non-transfer strain in zero. And as far as I understand, these can be non-transfer strains. That's what I was like the general. The general yeah. 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 Of the Bentley and Lang. Yeah. So it is kind of like a. Uh, I mean, you somehow you have this locus Steinberg system basis. When you're doing the Poisson sum, you have these n bases. There are some sub loci. Like non-transferred part. This is all about non-transferred part of the spectrum, by the way. This uh, uh, stuff all about this is about non-transferred part. And but this, like, why do I think this is a bit more approachable? Because this does not involve. This is for each n, so you, it does not involve the extra averaging of n. Okay, so uh, Bill is telling me he's stuck. 
They're very explicit, so they're all about constant changing terms. But somehow, one may actually get their hands on these terms. And I believe, actually, uh, for example, um, yep, Yapsin has a, a paper which she uses kind of like, I mean, th these are all within the same realm of ideas of like the third view of group of groups, right? Um, the monoid or the third way of monoid or like in this case, assertion H itself is a new view of the algebra. There are certain terms that are showing up their face over there, and I believe they actually are all related to this, right? All of these extra terms that are coming from proportions within and uniform abundance in classes in GLN are showing there as this whole. But I haven't looked at it that much, but I think, I mean, this, this I think is a, is a more readily applicable way to map. But thanks for listening. I will see you